you all said together, amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Can of faith and not want more. If I can draw your attention to Mark 11 and really verse 23, really in the King James Version, where Jesus says, For verily I say unto you, that whoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and doubt not in his heart, but believe that those things which you say shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Tell somebody, have faith in God. Come on, tell somebody else, say, hey, other neighbor, have faith in God. I'm determined that you will have faith in God. You don't even know what you just did. You just spoke life to somebody. You just spoke hope to someone. You just changed someone's pers perspective in this particular moment. It is my constant prayer that we will have faith in God. The Lord spoke to me uh, 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 some time ago and said, Andy, I, I want you to say something about faith that hasn't necessarily been said. And I, for someone like me who has put a tremendous amount of respect to some of the greatest faith leaders in the world, studied under them, read their materials, went to school, sacrificed and paid to go to a place like Ramah under a guy named Kenneth Hagin. Many of you don't even know this guy, Kenneth Hagin, but, but he was one of the modern-day fathers of faith. For someone like me to want to study and to believe God, to have the gift of faith, and to want to walk by faith and not by sight, the guys that had faith in the stuff that they could not see, they were my heroes, the people that were able to actually have faith and to believe for something that they didn't quite have. And in all of your getting, you got to get faith. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Andy, I want you to say something about faith that had necessarily been said. I'm going to tell you the truth. Honestly, I wasn't interested in saying anything about faith that hadn't already been said because I thought that the guys that said great stuff had said enough. And I was applying the stuff that they were saying. And quite honestly, I just wanted what they had. I looked at them, and I figured if I can just be like Fred Price, if I can just be like these guys, if I just, if I just take their faith words and apply them, I'm good to go. I'm not necessarily looking to say anything new about faith. But the Lord said, yeah, but son, I want you to say something different about faith. And I said, okay, Lord, I, I, if you want to use me in that way, I'm totally open to it. It's very interesting, World Overcomers, because, I, I mean, I, I, I suppose we know, especially those of us that are in this, in this early service, if you've been with me for a while, you know, I think of World Overcomers as a faith church. That, the, that the, the scripture of the church is, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. That if nothing else, I want you to walk out of here believing God. I want you to have faith in God. I want you to believe him. And, I, and so my response was awesome. Okay, God, I, if that's what you want me to do, I'll say something new about faith. And the Lord said, okay, let's look at Mark 11, 23 and 24 and 25. Now, quite honestly, beloved, in my estimation, Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, 25, the most preached verses on faith, the most analyzed verses on faith, to tell you the truth, wasn't really interested trying to re-preach Mark 11, 22 and 23 and 24 and 25. I, thought, I said, Lord, I thought you wanted me to maybe say something new about faith. I thought you were about to lead me to a passage that's about faith that, that no one's really analyzed. But for you to say, for me to say, hey, I want to say something new about faith and then say, all right, let's look at Mark 11, 22 and 23 and 24 and 25. In my estimation, I thought, Lord, there's just no way because everything there is to say about the passage has already been said. You know, you need to be careful when you think you just have the Bible all figured out. You need to be careful when you think that there's nothing new to see in a verse. The Lord said to me, oh, really? Is the, so you're telling me that you have gleaned all there is to glean, and you've seen everything that there is to see in the passage, and I quickly said, Lord, my bad. Don't be upset with me. All right, Lord, I'll look at Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24, and 25 again, and and for all of us that are familiar with the passage, for all of us that are familiar with the faith message, and it's a message that I have been preaching, then if you're not familiar with it, then let me just break it down for you really quickly. For those of us who are familiar with it, 
It's just a good reminder of it, that, that, that faith message that has been preached to us. The beginning of it is to have faith in God. It's, 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 the, it's the accepted truth. And I'll throw that on the screen. It's the accepted truth about this passage is, number one, to have faith in God. For you to actually have faith in God, you have faith, so have it in God. You have faith. The, the point of being here in church is you have faith. The aim is to have faith in God. You, you already have faith. You, you have faith in Delta, so have faith in God. You have faith in American Airlines, so have faith in God. You don't know how to fly. You, 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 have, you have faith in Wendy's drive through so have faith in God. You, you don't know who's in there. You don't know if they drop your food. Help us. You have faith in the cookout. You have faith in cookout shake. I don't know what they put in the shake, but it's so good I dream about it. You have faith in that. Have faith in God. You have faith in the back. Then have faith in God. That you have faith in the preschool where you drop your child off. So have faith in God. To take the faith muscle that we all have been given and to exercise that faith in God. And I'm excited about all of us coming together because a part of us coming together and worshiping together is to practice having faith in God. Anybody to hear what I'm saying to you this morning? Having faith in God. That I came to worship, I came to praise Him, I came to sense Him because I need to have faith in God. And all of the things that it's going to take to have faith in, having faith in a spouse or faith in marriage or faith in my company or faith in the Word they told me, I, I got to take that muscle and I have to have faith in God. That's the initial part of the message, the truth that was been, has been accepted, which is, which is to have faith in God because, number two, faith moves mountains. Faith moves mountains. And that mountain moving faith is activated by your mouth. This is something that we've accepted. This is a faith truth that we've accepted. That whosoever shall say into this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and doubt not in his heart, but believe those things he says shall come to pass. He has what he says. It is the accepted truth that faith will move a mountain. That I want a faith to move every mountain. Faith to speak to my obstacle and for it to get out of my way. Sick the truth. Something that we have been taught. Something that we have accepted. Something that I have used to get to where I am. Praise God for it. It's the accepted truth. The third part of it is that faith is not apathy. Faith is not apathy. This is the accepted truth. Faith is not apathy. That, that's why I read it on the King James Version because King James Version says, what, so, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. You got to want it to have faith for it. You have to figure out what it is that you desire. Last Sunday, we asked the question, what do you expect? You have to say, okay, what is it that I desire? Whatsoever things I desire, whatsoever things that I actually am wanting, faith is not, well, if it comes, it comes. Faith is not, well, if it happens, it happens. Faith is, no, I want that, and I'm going to believe God for that. Faith is, this is something that I'm determined to have. This is something that I desire. I can't act like it's not important to me. Faith says I desire it. Whatsoever things I desire when I pray, believe that I receive it and I have it, that it's what you desire, that faith does not settle. Faith does not settle. You can't have faith and not want more. Can't have faith and not want more. It's the accepted truth that if I'm going to have faith, then I'm going to end up wanting something greater. If I'm going to have faith, then I'm going to start looking for the impossible. If I'm going to have faith then I'm going to start lifting my eyes above just what I see and start looking at the degree that I don't see and looking at the house that I don't see and looking at the blessing that I don't see. And although a lot of us were almost raised to settle, I was almost raised to settle. I was raised by parents who taught me to be grateful for what I got, whether I wanted it or not. They almost made you happy about stuff that you didn't almost. They made you be happy about stuff that you were not happy about. 
They told you, fix your face. And as they handed you something, they were looking at you to see how you looked. And if you didn't look right, they'd be like, oh, you don't want this ice cream? And then they made you smile about stuff that you wanted to cry about. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. They almost made you so that you don't need to think. Oh, see, that's what's wrong with you. You think the world owes you something. And so you start to have this. So now you are almost looking to live a life in which you settle. But I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. They, they didn't mean any harm. They just didn't have no money. They were broke. They just had to teach you. You just got to, you got to do this. This is what you got to eat. My, my, I, I think after my, my parents used to, my dad used to, my, my, my dad used to buy this ice cream called Neapolitan ice cream. I don't know if y'all know about Neapolitan ice cream. Neapolitan, first of all, it was the cheap ice cream. It wasn't even good. It wasn't even Briars. It was, it was the store Neapolitan ice cream. They ate the good stuff, but, but we got the Neapolitan. Neapolitan is vanilla and strawberry strawberry and chocolate all in the same box. Y'all don't know what I mean. <laughs> because they, because they got to find a way to get a half gallon with three flavors in it. <laughs> and, and they're the three most basic flavors. And, and now my mom, thankfully my mother, would scoop just vanilla and give you just vanilla or just chocolate and give you just chocolate. But if you said, can I have Rocky Road? They would look at you like, you better shut your mouth on that Rocky Road. You better eat this vanilla and be glad you get some vanilla. See, that's what's wrong with you. You think the world owes you cookies and cream, but you better eat this Neapolitan ice cream. And so it was almost this, no, be glad you got what my dad would do is my dad would roll all three flavors together and put it on a cone for you. And now you're trying to eat the ice cream you like around the ice cream that you don't like, and you bet not throw that ice cream away. My point is, is that we were almost raised to not want what we want, to not desire anything, where the Word says, whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, because faith is not apathy, faith does not settle. And then the final part of the truth, which is a truth that we have accepted about this passage, is that I have to believe it before you see it. You believe it before you see it. You believe it before you see it. What's over things you desire? When you pray, believe that you receive it and you shall have it. You don't have to believe it if you already have it. You believe it before you have it. You ask God to heal you and you believe you are healed before the healing manifests in your body. Come on, 9 o'clock. Y'all going to have to talk to me. That you are asking God for a miracle, and you walk out praising God for the miracle, even though the miracle hasn't manifested itself yet. As a matter of fact, they talked about praising. You give God praise as an act of faith, that you praise God in advance, and we will praise God in advance for what he's about to do. They would tell us, get it in your mind what you're believing God for, and then praise him and thank him before you see it. You don't wait until you get it to thank him. You thank him now, and you give and praise as a layaway on what you're believing God for and you say thank you and then every time it comes to your mind of what it is that you're believing God for that you don't have, you don't ask God for it again. You just thank him that he heard you and it's already done. I wish I had. You just say Lord, I thank you that I've received my healing. Lord, I thank you that I've received my scholarship. Lord, I thank you that I have my job. I may not have the job yet but Lord, I'm thanking you in advance because I believe that I have prayed and you have heard me and I believe that I receive it and then I have it. I have it after I believe I have it. That I'm wealthy in here before I'm wealthy out there. That everything in my life is a manifestation of something I already saw. That anyone that has faith saw it before it happened. I don't know if you've ever been around anybody like that that can walk around and say, and then I'm going to put this here, and then I'm going to put that there, and then I'm going to move this, and I'm going to paint that wall this, and I'm going to do that. They saw it before it was manifested. That you believe it before you see it. 
It's amazing. And many of, for many of us, this message still works. For many of us, this message is enough. The blood still works. For many of us, this was a good message right here. For many of us, we are ready to go. For many of us, this is amazing. It is a good reminder. I got to believe God before I see it. I, I can't walk just by what I see. I got to walk by what I believe, that I have to have faith in God, and that I have to forgive people so that I can keep unforgiveness from blocking me from what I'm believing God for, which I'm not even going to mess with that because that passage is just, uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it alone, even though I could, I could spend the rest of the message on it, but that's not really my assignment for this morning. But in essence, that I have to understand that, 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 there, that I have to believe it before I see it, and that's amazing, and it's awesome. Here's what the Lord has said to me that's changed the way that I see this passage and I've put it in this book that I have called More. And, uh, and, and it's, it's a truth, really, that's really enhanced it. It hasn't changed the way that I see the passage, but it's just enhanced the passage. And, uh, and this, this new faith truth is this. I'll share it with you. The first point now, what the Lord has said to me, and really is, it's what's in this book more. And I'm releasing this book today, and I'll be in the lobby afterwards. And, uh, and I, I wrote this book a while ago. It's interesting that, I, that I've written so many books, and, and the books that we've published have been relationship books. But most of the books that I've written have been books, are books that are written about faith, because faith is what has kept me breathing. Faith is how I see the world. Faith is how I am where I am. And uh, I just haven't necessarily been released really to release them, but I'm, I'm releasing this book today, this and it's new faith truth, and it enhances it. Here's the first thing, and that is that mountain-moving power is for people on a journey. First thing, when I, whenever I thought of whosoever was saying this mountain be thou removed, cast in the sea, doubt not his heart, believe those things says come to pass, I have whatever he says. I always thought of that as just obstacles and, and rebuking mountains. I thought of that mostly as sicknesses and diseases and attacks of the enemy. That's the main way that I saw it. But the Lord said to me, actually, well, this passage is, is actually for people that are trying to get from here to there because you can be obedient and still be blocked. It's absolutely possible for the Lord to say, go there, and for you to say, all right, and on your way there, there are obstacles in your way that you are going to have to deal with. This passage is for movers. This power is for movers. You don't get this power just to sit and say you have it. You get this power because you see where you are, and you realize that there's a place that you're going that we realize that the first journey of Abraham, his first faith move was a move move. So that I actually understand that mountain moving power is for people on a journey. And so I have to first figure out where I'm going before I even begin to speak to mountains. Before I even have an expectation to have faith, I have to first ask myself, where am I? And I have to ask myself, where am I going? Because mountains are a part of a journey on my way somewhere. The second thing that the Lord said to me that really blew my mind, and I, and I, and it's, and I'm, I shared in this book, and I'm, I'm going to just attempt this morning just to give you a little bit of a hint of just what's in the book. I can't preach all of it to you, obviously, but, and I, I don't want to anyway, but, but, but the second thing is that mountains are moved in more than one way. Mountains are moved in more than one way. That it's not just I speak it and curse it and it moves. Certainly, that's what Jesus is talking about when he says, speak to the mountain. He curses the fig tree and the, and the fig tree dries up, but I realize that there's more than one way to move the mountain that's in front of me. That I'm on my way somewhere, and when I get to this mountain, I, speaking to it and praying against it is one way. It's the first way. I speak, and it moves. That's prayer. I speak, 
and it moves, that's prayer. And I certainly have done that. On my way somewhere, a mountain obstacle was in my way. I spoke to that mountain, and it moved. But I've also had the experience of speaking to a mountain, and it didn't go nowhere. I know I'm not the only one. I have the experience of praying against that mountain, and that mountain didn't move an inch. Matter of fact, I went to the mountain moving conference and gave my mountain moving offering, and that mountain stayed right there, and I began to realize that there's more than one way to move that mountain. The first way is I speak to it and it moves, but the second way is that I climb the mountain and you move. You climb the mountain and you move. That's progress. Sometimes I speak to the mountain and it gets out my way. Other times I climb the mountain because there's a perception and a perspective I gained at the top of that mountain that I won't gain if I don't ascend it. Matter of fact, the Lord let the mountain be there in my path, not for me to rebuke it, but for me to climb it so that I could get a glimpse of what was beyond it and really see where he really was leading me. And I got really excited when I got to the top of the mountain. The challenge of getting to the top of the mountain is once you get to the top of the mountain, it takes work to get to that top of that mountain. And for you to move on, you are going to have to come down that mountain, walk through a valley for a bit to climb the next mountain. One of the things that happens to many of us is that we become satisfied with the mountain that we're on. And we see other mountains beyond it, but because of the work that it took to get to the top of this mountain, we ain't thinking about going down this other. It took a lot for me to get in this company. It took a lot for me to get the position I have. It took a lot for me to be supervisor. Are you trying to, but when I get there, I see all the deals that are happening. I realize where the money really goes, and I have to ask myself, do I want to come down this mountain, walk through a valley of starting my own thing to try to ascend a higher mountain? There's some of us, the energy it took to get to this mountain, it's just too much to descend and ascend again. But the question is, can you decrease to increase? I realize that, that I've, there are mountains in my way, and the way that I moved that mountain is I moved me. The problem was that I was in the wrong place. I rebuked Boston Mountains until I realized the Lord just didn't want me in Boston no more. I need a witness. So I, I was frustrated about mountain, Boston Mountains that wouldn't move until I realized the Lord wasn't trying to move the mountain. The Lord had put the mountain there to get me to get out of the lane that I was in. He had something different for me. When I was in my dad's denomination, I kept bumping into these denominational political issue mountains and I was frustrated and spoke to them and prayed against them. But I'm so glad that God did not answer my prayer because if he had, I'd have been stuck in a movement that would have limited what God really wanted to do in my life. Good God. So I realized that the problem wasn't them, the problem was me. And instead of speaking to them, I spoke to myself. And as I talked to myself, I talked myself up one side of that mountain and down the other side of it to get on to the place where the Lord wanted me to get to because I'm on a journey. Am I preaching to anyone this morning? It's all in the book. It's all in the book. But then I speak, I climb the mountain, and you move. And then the third way that you move mountains is that you tunnel through the mountain and find wealth. That mountains make me dig deeper. The mountain made me have to dig down. And when I dug down, I found out there's gold in them dare hills. That if I'm not careful, I live a very shallow existence that's all just about the stuff I want. And I want everything quick. And I want everything easy. And I want everything fast. But sometimes the mountain makes me slow down. And I can't get around it. And I can't. Sometimes it's too high to get over it. And I had to tunnel through that mountain. And I had to get down to the bottom of myself and realize that there was a depth that I had. There was a depth to the journey that wasn't going to happen quick. 
And as I dug deep and tunneled through, I found out that there was a treasure in the mountain, and I was glad I didn't rebuke it. All mountains can't be rebuked because some of the mountains that are there that are part of your landscape are placed there for you to find wealth in the mountain. Then the third thing that the Lord said to me about mountains, and maybe this isn't new to you, but it was new to me, and that is that not all mountains are from the enemy. Not all mountains are from the enemy. Now, of course, when I look at the passage, you over to say, this mountain be down, move, cast in the sea. I just automatically thought of the mountain as an attack of the enemy. Sickness, an attack of the enemy. Tumors, an attack of the enemy. Poverty is an attack of the enemy. Lack is an attack of the enemy. And I'm going to speak to that mountain until it be down, move, cast in the sea, doubt not heart. And I, because I see it as an attack of the enemy, but the Lord helped me to see that actually not all mountains are a part of the attack of the enemy. Not all mountains are the devil. There are some mountains that are the enemy. There are some mountains that are the devil. There are some mountains that I have dealt with that have been an obstacle, an obstruction placed in my path by the devil. But also, I've come to the understanding that some mountains are life. Some mountains are life. Some mountains are life. Some mountains are your life. Some mountains you're dealing with because you're a black man, because you're a black woman, because you're a white man, because you're an Hispanic woman, because you are an Asian person. There are mountains that you are dealing with that other people don't deal with. Some mountains are the cards you have been dealt. Now you can sit around complaining about those mountains or you can stop and say, Lord, why have you allowed this mountain to be in my way? Lord, why did you send me here in this black body, in this white body, in this short body, in this tall body, in this dark body, in this light body, in this hippie body, in this... Th Lord, what is it that you're saying to me about me? Because I can sit around here complaining about the mountains and rebuking them so that I don't have to deal with them. But there are some mountains that life has dealt me. And I realize that those mountains are here for a purpose. And then there are some mountains that are God. Some mountains there are God. They are the mountain of the Lord. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He did has clean hands and a pure heart. That actually, there are some mountains that God has placed that mountain there. God has allowed that mountain to take place. The Lord has actually, sure, there are some that are attacking the enemy, but some of them are just the way life is, and then some of them, this is the Lord that has allowed this. God has done this. Some of these mountains are just God. And it led me to the final truth that I want to share with you. And that is mountains are inevitable. Mountains are inevitable. I stopped seeing this passage as a passage of, oh, just in case you ever see a mountain, whosoever is saying in this mountain, be thou removed the cast into the sea, and doubt not in his heart. I always saw it as a passage that applied to the surprise of a mountain in which the Lord said to me, actually, if you are going to do anything, you are going to deal with mountains. You might as well get yourself ready because mountains is going to be the journey. Anybody learned that yet in the 9 o'clock? That a word to God that every path to, to great was just a smooth path. That the path to more was just a smooth path. The fact of the matter is anybody that's on their way to more, anybody that's on their way to greater is going to deal with mountains. If you have a conversation with anyone that has done anything great, Bill Gates, Bill Gates, Oprah, and no matter who they are, if you sit down and have a conversation with them, they're not going to tell you about a journey that was low and quick and fast and smooth and easy. They're going to tell you they had to encourage themselves. They're going to tell you sometimes they were up, sometimes they got 
low. Sometimes it didn't look good. They had to press through a valley to, uh, to reach another mountaintop. I began to realize that it doesn't even make any sense to think about this passage unless I understand it from the perspective that I'm going to deal with mountains. That mountains are inevitable. I know we want to rebuke them right away, but no path to more is a flat path. No path to greater is a flat path. Nobody gets there on a flat way. Anybody that's done anything great has done it with some opposition. Anybody that's experienced anything, anyone we admire, anyone that we look at, any one of us in here that want to go to the next level, the next level is a new mountain. The next level is new challenges. The next level is new devil. The next level is new pain. And I can ask for more and greater and not be prepared to be a little scared. And if I don't want to have nothing to do with mountains, then I don't want to have nothing to do with greater. I need a witness. If I don't want to have nothing to do with mountains, then I don't want to have, then I'm not going to have anything to do with more. I can't have faith and not want more. And I can't get to more without dealing with mountains. When I realized that, I, when, I, when I saw that, the Lord said to me, yeah. And so understand that since mountains are about a journey and really, the journey is about greater, and the journey is about more, and the journey is about higher. The truth is that you are going to deal with mountains, and that there are five mountains that you are going to deal with on your way to more. That's what I talk about in the book. The book really talks about these five mountains on your way to great on your way to greater. As a matter of fact, the fifth mountain that I talk about in the book is the mountain of more itself, the mountain of greater itself. Because for many of us, for many of the people that we admire, their next challenge has to do with the fact that they actually want more. So I can't say I want more and not look for that mountain. I realize that more itself, great itself, greater itself is a mountain that has to be climbed. That I can't rebuke it. That there are these five mountains on the way that I'm going to deal with. I'm going to deal with every one of these mountains. It don't make any sense rebuking it. I'm going to deal with these five mountains. I'll give you the first one. I already told you the last one. The first mountain, I'm not going to, it's in the book. I can't possibly preach all of it to you. I'm going to be talking about it for the next several weeks. But it's all in this book called More that, that we have available today. And, and I'm getting ready to start running around and selling it everywhere. But I wanted to release it to you all first. It's only Sunday. I'm really going to do, do it like this. But I will be in the lobby and talking about the book and, and signing books if you'd like to get it. But the first mountain is the mountain of personal identity. First mountain is the mountain of personal identity. You cannot rebuke the personal identity mountain. You have to come to grips with who you are. First step on your way to greater is knowing who you are. Worst thing you can do is try to get to greater using somebody else's weapons. Worst thing you can do is to try to get to more trying to use somebody else's gifts. And in our particular world and day and time, especially because of this, we are so enamored with everybody else that we haven't even figured out who we are. We know everything about Beyonce and don't know nothing about ourselves. We know everything about their marriage and don't know what's going on with our own marriage. We know all this that we can get on Wikipedia. We can tell you everything about Jay-Z and don't know who we really are. At some point, you better come to grips with you. Scariest passage in all the Bible is seven sons of Sceva. I don't know if you ever heard that passage. That passage before where seven sons of Sceva trying to speak to this demon. It's in the book of Acts. It says, in the, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches about, we command you to come out. And the demon speaks back and says, Jesus I know. Paul I've heard about, but who are you? 
It's an excellent question. Who are you? You can't get to greater trying to be somebody else. At some point, you have to come to grips with who you are and you have to ask some questions about yourself and know yourself. You ain't ready to date nobody else till you date yourself. And ask yourself some questions and know some things about yourself. You will never get the greater wearing somebody else's shoes. At some point, you will have to say, all right, this is me. I cannot rebuke that. I cannot hide from it. I can't be so hidden in the identity of Christ that I never ask who I am. That I can do all things through Christ, that he is my strength, but that you can't see God and not see you. If you don't really see you, then you ain't really seeing the Lord. Because what he really is is a mirror. And so I realized that the first mountain, I'm not going to give you all five, they're in the book, but the first mountain, my point is, is it don't make no sense even thinking about rebuking all the mountains. Some of the mountains are meant to be rebuked, but this first mountain, this mountain of personal identity, you're going to have to climb up that mountain. You're going to have to tunnel through that mountain. You're going to have to dig down and figure out what your gifts really are. You're going to have to figure out and decide what you really want. You are really going to have to get down into it and the end the book, I basically give you 10 questions that you ought to ask yourself and things you ought to know about yourself. They're in the book. And then the fifth mountain, which is the mountain of greatness itself. And this is what I'm saying is that for many of us, I know for me, most of my challenges are coming from the desire to be great. And the, the greatness mountain is not a mountain to put behind you. The greatness mountain is a mountain to keep because there are fortresses built on top of mountains. When I went to Israel and I went to Masada and I saw the mountain fortress on top of the mountain because once you reach the top of that mountain, there's stuff that can't hit you when you're at the top of your mountain. There's attacks that can't reach you when you get to the top of your mountain. There's some of us, the Lord has allowed a mountain in our, in our range because he's trying to get us to build a fortress on the top of the mountain. We're so quick to rebuke it that we don't realize that the mountain has been given for us to have a defensible place and to me there's nothing worse than getting to great and don't stay there and so I talk about in the book what are the walls that need to be built as a part of the the fortress that's on the top of this mountain because I don't want to get it and lose it I don't want to make a million and then be broke tomorrow, God. I don't want to have a great marriage and then five years from now I'm divorced. I don't want to own a house only to lose it. Once I get to this place of great, I want to know what do I need to do to stay there. And there's nothing worse than somebody having the gifting to get to great and not having the discipline to stay there. And then something in their flesh or something in their world or something in their life or something in their pet drags them down. Good God, I don't want to end my life in infamy. I want to end my life in, I don't want to reach this high place. And we live in a world where people are built up and torn down. And I'm saying, Lord, I want to reach this highest place that you have for me. I want to get to more and when I get there, I'm determined to stay there. Can't have faith and not want more. And a part of the reason why I'm walking this relationship with God is that he has designed me for more. You are designed for more. If you eat too much, your skin just stretches. You won't pop. Because you are designed for more. You have an appetite that resets every day. Some of us got stretch marks. I'm looking for spiritual stretch marks. I, I want to be like, yeah, this is my spiritual. This is what I was. But the Lord has expanded me. And the Lord has stretched me. And the Lord has made me. Because he actually designed me to be able to expand for greater. To actually believe God. That his plan for me is more than what I see now. It's why we're here. To walk by faith and not by sight. Put your hands together if you heard a word from the Lord this morning. 
Jump on your feet. Reach out and grab your neighbor's hand. Let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you for what you said to us today. Thank you for living so big in us. Thank you for speaking to us and through us. Thank you for your word that truly is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. Thank you, Lord God, for the accepted truth, what we've always known about faith, what we've always been taught about faith. Thank you, Lord God, that that faith lesson is beat on our spiritual bones and has brought us to this place. Thank you that we are standing in faith, believing for something greater. But Lord, I also thank you that you have allowed us to be on this journey. And we are going from little to greater. We are going from less to more. You have us on a path to more, on a path to, you have designed us for greater. And so God, we surrender our lives to your will even in this moment that, Lord God, you would continue to fill us full of a desire and a passion that cannot be stopped. Thank you for a hope that cannot be quelled. Thank you for an anointing to walk after your will. Have your way in us even now and use us for your glory. Thank you for living so big in us today. Thank you for speaking to us and through us. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Cover us with your blood. Bring us back on Wednesday, Lord God. Next Sunday, God, as we're chasing after faith in you and faith in what we're believing you for, and we'll give you praise for what you do. Which is, thank you for the visitors that were with us today. Bring them back again to worship with us. And God, we pray as we always pray. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. For God, you're our rock. You're our redeemer. We really do love you. In Jesus' name we pray. We all sit together. Amen. God bless you. Greet somebody in the name of the Lord. Give somebody a holy hug. You are dismissed. The books are available in the lobby. I am going to be there, and I will be signing books. If you'd like for me to sign your book, and uh, I'm on my way there now.